Hello, welcome. I'm Lori Berman. I'm Vice President of Membership and Development for the Small Business Association of Michigan. Want to welcome you today to today's webinar, Marketing Planning for 2021. A great timeless topic and we have a guest speaker today, Lynn Galadner, that I will introduce to you in just a moment. Today's webinar is part of a series of webinars that the Small Business Association does for small business owners across the state of Michigan. Today's webinar will be pushed out live. It is being pushed out live on Facebook. So welcome to our Facebook guests, also live on Zoom. It will be recorded and live both on Zoom and also on Facebook. Uh, we will send the slides out later that Lynn is showing today. For those of you that are watching, those will be posted on our website. You can see those later. I encourage each of you to use the question and answer function that's in here. Lynn will be taking your questions as we go through today's program. If you have questions that are unrelated to marketing, today's topics, if you have questions about PPP loans or something else, I ask that you send those to sbam at sbam.org. All right, let's talk about today's speaker. Lynn Galadner. Lynn is founder and chief creative officer of Your People LLC, a marketing and public relations firm that she started in 2007. She is also a host of the Make Meaning podcast and founder of the Make Meaning movement. She leads through training and courses about how to market with meaning and purpose to your work. Lynn's also an author of eight books. Lynn, looks like you have a book coming out in February. Uh, this is your ninth book. And what's your story? Marketing with Meaning and Living from Purpose. Uh, that sounds like a great book. We look forward uh, to reading that and learning more about your storytelling, relationship building, etc. I wanted to add too that Lynn came to us through her relationship with a civility project. She manages that team. Some of you may have seen that at our annual meeting. Uh, we also did a webinar. And if you want to know more about that, that lives on our site as well. Lynn is also a member of the Small Business Association of Michigan. So with that, Lynn, I'm going to turn it over to you. I'll let it let you take it away and we'll monitor the question and answers for you. Thank you so much, Lori. It's such a pleasure to be here and I'm thrilled with that everybody um, is coming to get some tips and get a head start on 2021. Thank you to the Small Business Association of Michigan for hosting this. So I'm gonna jump in and um, share my screen and we will get started. Um, what we're gonna do today is we're going to look at how to plan your marketing for 2021. And I am such a planner. Um, with December is always the month that I work with my clients to look at the next year and see what we're going to do. Um, I think it's really important to have a roadmap and a, a vision for what you want to accomplish and how you will get there. And so we're going to talk today about how you can do that for your company, for your business, and get started. Um, and I'm happy to help. So this is all of my information. You'll see the websites, email, and phone number on the screen. Feel free to jot them down or take a screenshot. I'd love to hear from you guys. All right. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about how we infuse purpose into our work and why that's so important for planning. Um, as Lori told you, I run a marketing and public relations company, but I also am the host of a podcast where we talk about meaning and purpose. And the book that I wrote that is coming out in the winter of 2021, What's Your Why, is all about how we use purpose and meaning to market and how that makes our businesses more successful. Um, there's a lot of research that shows that companies, brands, and entrepreneurs are more successful, have more impact, and are actually happier with their work when there's purpose driving their work. And so that's something I'd like you guys to think about today as we are together. Why are you doing the work you're doing? What's the purpose behind your company? How is there meaning in what you do every day? And that's going to inform your marketing. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. All right, so who am I and why am I here to, to give this to you guys today? Well, I work with entrepreneurs, businesses, schools, universities, and my focus is to help people market with meaning. Um, there's always been a formula that my company has employed that's been really successful for us, which is strategic storytelling, mutually beneficial relationships, and higher purpose. Those three elements are the core concepts behind successful marketing. And so we have to first know your story, which is not as easy as you think. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we have to figure out who needs to hear the story? Who do you need to have relationships with? And then of course the why, what's driving your work? And so when you can articulate really clearly all three of those elements and weave them into your marketing endeavors, there is a reason for people to connect with you. There's a heartstrings connection, 
Um, it's that people do business with people. And so we'll want to take a look at all of those things. All right, so let's jump in and get started. So <clears throat> when you're thinking about marketing planning, um, it can seem a little daunting. And I like to create a roadmap because um, when we put together a plan, it gives us a starting point. Now, I'm going to give you full disclosure. I do these really long, complicated, detailed plans for my own company and for my clients at the end of the year, looking ahead to the year to come. And it gets as specific as what media topics are we going to pitch? Um, what social media strategy do we have? What days are we posting? What are our social media pillars? When do we send an e-blast? I put together an editorial calendar. We do all of this and we plan it out. But usually somewhere mid-year, like by six months in, we find that we're sort of veering away from the plan. So you might ask, why would I make a plan in the first place if that's gonna happen? Well, here's the thing. When you start to make a plan, you have a path to follow. And if you follow that path, you will be successful in your marketing outreach and it will lead you to other things. So if by mid-year, when you have new things happening, new services or products that you're offering, things that are growing out of all of the successes you've had already during the year, you can pivot in your marketing endeavors and that's totally natural and normal. So don't be afraid if you do all this planning and then halfway through you're like, oh, I'm sort of going rogue, that is totally normal. So in order to start with this plan, I want you to think it, about it in three steps. Number one is to identify your purpose. That's really, really important. <laughs> at, at the top of every marketing plan is your mission statement. And the reason for that is because all the activities and tactics that you employ should sort of point back to your mission. So we need to know why you're doing what you're doing. What is your purpose? And I'm gonna get into all these steps in subsequent slides. Then after you can articulate your purpose, you want to ask yourself, what do you want to accomplish? What tasks, activities, and relationships can get you there? So the accomplished part is your business goals. And um, that is really like, we want 10 new customers. We want revenues in this range. We want to launch a new program. Very, very specific business goals. And then the, the third step is the ta tactics, activities, and the relationships, the people who are going to get you from here to your goals by year end. So this is a strategy that's super important and it needs to go in that order for you to have the clarity that is necessary to make an impact and to be successful. So in order to grow your business, you have to be strategic. There's just no shortcut to planning ahead and getting organized. And at the same time, you have to accept the reality that it's a slow and steady build. Nothing in marketing happens overnight. It requires your frequent attention and your commitment to stay the course. Those are super important things to recognize because once you realize that it's not gonna happen overnight, it's not one marketing endeavor, and then you're golden, then you can sort of settle in for the journey. I'll tell you guys a funny story. Um, part of marketing is media relations. So we're pitching newspapers and TV and radio and podcasts to get our clients exposure. And there's always a blip of activity after a media, media appearance. So I'll book a client on the radio and they'll have a great interview and they'll get some more calls or inquiries in the next 24 to 48 hours, especially after being on TV. But that's usually the only time for this spike. So a lot of people think if they just do one media interview, they're going to just have a whole new audience of customers. And you may get a few, but then it dies down. And the reason for that is because there's marketing research that people need to be touched by a brand an average of seven times before they take action. And what that means is they need to see you in a lot of different places and venues in order to have confidence engaging with your brand. But the most successful way that people are um, inspired to connect with your brand is through referral, is through that human relationship. It just validates that referral to have seen you on TV, to have read about you in the paper, to have seen an ad that you placed somewhere or to watch your social media. But when somebody you know and trust says, you should move forward on this, you're likely to do it. You just have the confidence because of all the different marketing endeavors that have come before. So I hope that makes sense. And we're gonna dive into the individual steps in just a moment. Remember if you have questions as we're going along to throw them in the Q&A because I'm happy to address them as we make progress. 
Now, I did want to offer everybody who's participating um, my marketing strategy template. I'm happy to email it to you and you can use it. I'm not going to go through it on the webinar today because it's quite long. Um, usually ends up being like 10 pages when I do them for a client. If you want it, just email me. There's my email on the screen and let me know that you want the marketing strategy template and I'll be happy to send it along to you. So I'm happy to give you the tools that make this a little bit easier. All right, let's look at step one. What is your purpose? Now, I would love it if you have a pen and paper handy and you want to take a moment to try to explore this right now. I can give you guys a minute or two and we can even talk about it. But think about some pretty deep and searching questions. For example, why does your business or organization exist? You know, what is the reason that your company needs to be on this planet? Who are you helping and how are you helping them? And then think about, have you written this down? Have you thought about your story? So I did say early on that our formula for marketing is storytelling plus relationships plus higher purpose. So the storytelling is a pretty important piece of it. It's sort of the first piece and it does come from that purpose. If you know why you're doing what you're doing, what the inspiration was for your company, that is, makes it a lot easier to articulate what I call a foundational narrative. Your story should distinguish you from the competition. It should give really tangible and specific details about what makes you really special and why the work you're doing is so meaningful and different from any competition that may, may be out there. The foundational narrative is something that we spend a lot of time on. And there are clients who come to me and we spend several months articulating their foundational narrative. So let me tell you just a little bit about what that is. Um, you may have some of these elements already and it may be worthwhile to go back and review them as well. The foundational narrative includes things like mission statement and vision statement, taglines, and then what I call the foundational or anchor content, which is anywhere from five to 10 paragraphs that is your story. And it sounds like five to 10 paragraphs, that's not so hard, I can do that, but it actually is a lot harder than you think because you need to think about what are the details, the people, the places, the numbers, any quantifiable items that you need to include in this story that are going to compel people to want to patronize your business. So it takes some time. It's not, it's not at all about what do I think is so great about my business? It's why would somebody want to come to me and purchase what I have to offer? And that means getting in the shoes of your customers. One of the biggest misses in marketing is not really knowing your audience or thinking anybody can be my customer. Have you ever said that? Because I've had lots of people come to me and say that. And while in theory, maybe it's true, it's pretty hard to market to everybody. So you really want to make sure that you have a, a very clear focus and vision for who you want as your customer. So when I work with a client to determine their foundational narrative, we will interview people in the company, current clients, past clients, um, founders. You know, If there's a board of directors, we'll interview some of them. We'll, we'll do maybe 12 interviews with different key people to understand their perspective of the company. And usually what happens is the same words and phrases and concepts come up again and again. And that's really helpful because that helps to articulate what is special about the company. So you see why it might take us a couple of months to get there. So mission, vision, tagline, five to 10 paragraphs of anchor content. You, you might do core values in there and usually a boilerplate, which is about a three paragraph distilled foundational story that you'll put at the end of a press release or in a brochure. So all of that goes into the foundational narrative. And it's super important to be able to articulate your purpose so that other people know who you are, what you do, why you do it, and why they should engage with you. That's a pretty meaty first step. And it's something I'd encourage you guys to think about. When you think about this, try to get as specific as possible. So I was a journalist for 15 years before I got into marketing and public relations. And so I'm all about the writing, the storytelling, the details. Um, I have found in writing that the more specific you get, the more universally relatable what you have to say is. I know that sounds kind of funny, but it's really true. The more narrowly you focus, the more likely you are to attract your audience because you're so clear on what, who they are and what they need. All right, so what is your purpose? If you have time after this webinar, jot down these three questions and see if you can just free write. 
and come up with some answers because that's going to be your first step in a solid marketing plan. Oops. Alrighty. Step two is what do you want to accomplish? And this is, you know, kind of an easy question, kind of not an easy question. So I just did some business planning for my company for 2021. And I, I know what I want to do. I know what trainings and courses I want to launch. I know what kinds of clients I'd like to bring on. Um, when I started to think about what I want my annual revenues to be, I felt like I was playing Monopoly. Like, well, this number or that number, um, you know, I know what I need to cover costs and to cover salaries and things like that. But why would I want this revenue over that revenue? And it's a really important question. So step two of your marketing planning is to get really clear on what your business goals are for the year to come. So what do you want to accomplish with your business and why do you want to accomplish that? So I was actually in a conversation uh, with business planning folks on my team and we were looking at the annual revenues that we're shooting for. And it really felt like I could say any particular number and we could try to get there. And the great thing about getting specific with numbers is that you work backwards and you say, well, then that means I need to have this many participants in a course and I need to sell this many widgets and I need to have this many retainer clients or whatever it is. And it makes it so much easier to make it happen. So when you have numbers associated with your planning, you end up being able to achieve that. So if you know you just need to sell you know, five packages, you can do that or you need a hundred participants in a course, you can do that because then you start to figure out, well, where am I gonna find those hundred participants and how am I going to reach them and what's going to compel them? So you see that when you start with a big picture goal, you can work backwards to all of the different things that you need to do to get yourself there. But I think that it's a harder question than you might realize. What you want to accomplish in the next year needs to tie into your overall vision for the work that you do. So we started this whole conversation talking about meaning and purpose. And the reason why that's such an important part of marketing planning is that if you have a sense of why you're doing what you're doing, what change you want to make in the world, you know, like at the end, this is what I want to do. So when I work backwards, each year is getting me a step closer to that end goal. If you don't know your why, it's really hard to keep going. And next year becomes just like this year becomes just like last year. Hopefully not with a pandemic, but you know what I mean. So I think that it's really important to be having an honest conversation with yourself, with your team. This is a great exercise to do with the whole company or with your leadership executives, um, just to start to understand the why behind the work that we're doing. So you provide something valuable to the marketplace, but who do you want to help? And how are they going to be, be better for having worked with you? These are pretty deep questions and believe it or not, they're really important for guiding your marketing because otherwise you're just spinning wheels. Marketing is something you spend time and money on and it's supposed to be tools to get you where you want to go. If you don't know where you want to go, why would you engage in any of this in the first place, right? I want to remind everybody that we have the Q&A and so if you have questions, please pop them in as we're going along because I'd love to make this more of a conversation than um, me just sort of posturing. So I'd love to hear from you guys. So step one is knowing your purpose. Step two is articulating your goals and your business goals are really what I'm talking about, getting as specific as possible for the next year. When you set goals for anything, whether it's a year or a particular program or a product, they need to have certain details to them. We usually use the acronym SMART. So that stands for specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound. So again, I've been saying specific a lot. You're seeing a, a theme here. I notice there's a question. Lori, do you wanna jump into the question and then I can continue with this? Yes, it is a comment saying, this is good. Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> I agree, <laughs> uh, great content. So, so nothing yet, but please do post a uh, question. Okay. Great, thank you so much, I appreciate that. All right, so as I said, getting specific about your goals makes them easier to achieve. And it can be hard and it can be uncomfortable. So just remember that. So some of the examples for goals that you might want to articulate for 2021, we mentioned revenues, that's always helpful. Um, but again, you know, don't be afraid of crunching the numbers, taking a look at 
what you need, all your costs and your overhead and any kind of um, anything that you have to recoup. And then what kind of a profit margin do you want? And why is that? The, the why is so important, you know, sure, I'd love to make millions and just have, you know, endless revenues, wouldn't we all? But is there a reason for that? And if so, what am I going to do with it? Am I going to reinvest them into the company? Am I going to hire new people? Am I going to, you know, give bonuses at the end of the year? Have a why even for the money, not just to say, because cool, you know, I have more money, but because there's a real reason that it's going to move the company forward and the work that you're doing. Another idea for setting goals is the number of customers. So it depends how you work. If you're selling a product and you can have an infinite number of customers, um, you can articulate which customer audiences you wanna reach. Maybe you wanna break into a new customer audience. Maybe you want to um, develop a new audience that, that came to you in 2020, in 2021, make it bigger, broader, um, understand them better, build that relationship. If you have something like a, you know more of um, intellectual services like I offer marketing services or um, if you're a law firm or you know somebody who's offering sort of these um, support services in some way um, maybe you have larger retainer clients and so you only take on so many so is it 10 that you need in 2021 is it 30 um, do you need them at different tiers you know sometimes we'll have um, five figure clients uh, you know four figure clients and then like really quick program clients or, you know, for a particular project. And I would articulate how many of each. So how many just project only clients do you want? How many ongoing year long retainer clients do you want? And why? And where are you going to find them? Who is that audience? So for example, my company works with entrepreneurs. We work with schools and universities. In the past, we've worked with all kinds of retail, uh, food clients, um, nonprofits. We've worked with a lot of different businesses. And so when I look ahead at my marketing planning, I say, who do I want to work with in 2021? Do I want more schools? If I want more schools, who are they? Are they independent schools? Is it public school districts? Is it universities, community colleges, trade schools? The more specific I can get, even in that, looking at universities, let's say, I want universities that have 10,000 or fewer students. That is still a huge pool. And so the more specific you can get, the more likely you are to be able to attract those clients because you want to show up where they are going to be and show why you are keenly positioned to bring them on. Another idea for goals for 2021 would be types of programs or services. So I mentioned that I do courses and trainings. I do you know, one-on-one -on -one retainer clients, um, all different situations like that. So are there particular kinds of programs or services that we want to offer in 2021 and how much of them? And then when I do my planning, when I'm offering a course, for example, I look at the calendar and I say, I'm gonna offer one in January and I'm gonna offer one in April and I'm gonna start marketing three months before. So I really look at the calendar and I map it out so that I'm likely to succeed because I already have a plan. I know when it's gonna start and I know how much time I need to get people into it. Another goal is maybe you wanna bring on new team members, hire some staff. Um, there could be other goals that you wanna set for 2021. But these are all things to think about, and maybe all of them will factor into your marketing plan. And so just think about, you know, what, what do I want to accomplish in the year to come? Now, just a little bit about the SMART acronym here. So we talked about specific. Hopefully, you know um, now what I mean by that. When we talk about measurable, it needs to be something that we can gauge. Did I achieve that? Did I hit the goal? So again, if you say 100 customers, you know if you've gotten 97 or you've gotten 55. And that is a measurable um, detail about your goals. The next one is achievable. So we have to have sort of a down to earth conversation with ourselves. And I, is this a realistic goal? You know, can I, if I say I want um, 50 new clients from 50 new countries, you know, is that really achievable? Can I reach out to each of those countries in the next year? I don't know if I can, that might be a little too big. So maybe I wanna narrow it down to three countries and then I can really make progress in it. Or maybe I want my customers just in Michigan. I don't want to, you know, go outside of our borders. Um, making it achievable is, is really important for your team and for you because it will either give you confidence or not. And if you lack the confidence, you're not going to get to your goals. So achievable is something that you can tangibly do with the resources you have and the skills that you're marketing. Realistic is something that, you know, can actually happen. So like I said, I can't really 
service 50 countries in the next year. Not going to happen. So I'm not going to try, but I can try to deepen what I'm doing in existing places where I have clients. And then time bound. This is super important too. So in the marketing strategies that I create, it's usually a 12 month time frame, and we get very specific month by month. Um, but it's also valid to say, you know, we're going to do a quarterly marketing plan and we're going to revisit that each quarter. And when you have a time frame, you can, again, work backwards. So if my goal is through Q1, then I can look back and say, well, what's going to happen in January? What's going to happen in February? What's going to happen in March? So you want to make sure that you set yourself up for success by trying to articulate goals that hit the SMART rubric. All right. Remember, if you have questions, throw them in the Q&A so I don't lose you. All right, so we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about tasks, tasks, activities, and relationships. So you know what you want, you know why you're doing what you're doing. How do you get there? This is such an open-ended question. <laughs> There's so many things we can do in marketing. And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on each one in the coming slides. But I want you to think about tangibly what marketing means to you. So marketing is really a relationship between you and your audience. And a relationship is something that both sides need to put effort into. And it's something that you need to work on repeatedly, right? Think of any relationship that you have in your life. If you don't check in and they don't check in, it just sort of falls away. And you have to put that, you know, put that effort in. Same thing is, is true in business. Um, I have a really good friend who is from Dublin, Ireland. She lives in London now. And we have written letters to each other since 1993. And that's a long time. And that is a relationship that's really important to me. And how do I show that? I write her letters and she writes me letters. Um, sometimes we'll email, but mostly we like to get that letter in the mail. And that's a, a two-way street. There's mutual benefit. So remember that, that marketing has to be a mutually beneficial endeavor. It's something that you are going to put out there because it builds your business. You want customers to come to you so that you can achieve your goals. You can bring in revenues, you can satisfy your, your purpose, but what's in it for them? So we have to think about marketing through a lens of mutual benefit and understand why somebody would come to you, not just to help you achieve your goals or earn your revenues, but there's gotta be something in it for them too. And that's really, really important to remember. If you've never considered this notion of mutual benefit, now is a great time to do so. Because when you're looking at things like, one example of a marketing tool is your website. Yes, it's about you, but actually it should speak to the person who comes there. And there needs to be something that they find in your website that makes them feel better or reassured. And that's where the mutual benefit is. It's not just look at me, come give me business, but Here's the two-way street. So let's start to think about that a little bit. All right, so let's go through some of these marketing tasks. And these are some, they're not all, it's not an exhaustive list, but I'm gonna take you guys through some of the ways that you might want to engage in different marketing tasks to get you where you wanna go. All right, so first and foremost, social media. Everybody loves social media. We are broadcasting now live on Facebook. Um, it's a place where we live and a lot of people are really riveted by social media. And in the past year, because of all of the different lockdowns and situations we've had, we've turned to our digital uh, networking sites as a way of connection. So a lot of us have been stuck at home, working from home, and social media has been a really uh, great outlet for remembering that there are people out there that we can connect with. So why should your business be on social media? Now, I wonder if any of you have ever asked that question. You know. Did you just jump on because people are on it or did you have a reason? And that could be a very long conversation in a webinar in and of itself, so I won't belabor it, but I'm just gonna bring up a few little ideas. So with social media, you want to have a, re well, you want to have a reason for any marketing that you engage in, but for social media, you wanna have a reason because it requires so much attention. So if you're on social media, you need to be posting regularly, you need to be developing content and graphics, visuals, videos, if you are on social media, you need to engage with people, which means spending time responding to people's posts, commenting, liking, that kind of thing. It's a pretty involved process. So why should you do it? Well, one reason is so that you are where your customers are. And I always advise 
my clients to think about where their audience is on social media. Just because there's a social media platform doesn't mean you have to be on it or it makes sense for your business. And the more platforms you're on, the more work it is and the more overwhelming. It does not mean it's going to grow your bottom line. So you have to do this thoughtfully and with purpose and have a vision for how you're going to engage. So make yourself really ask the tough questions and limit the different platforms you're on knowing that the ones you choose are where your audience is and that's where you're going to connect. So social media is one great tool for marketing, but it's just a tool. And it alone is not going to grow your business. It's going to increase your brand awareness, but it does require attention. The second marketing outlet is media relations. So media relations is when you are pitching story ideas to media outlets. So that's TV, radio, print, podcasts, blogs, anywhere there is an audience. So somebody is sharing a story and there's an audience that's consuming it. And it's really exciting when your business is featured on TV or in the newspaper or something like that. Um, But you have to have a compelling story. So with media relations, you want to think about why you, why now? What is the news hook or the time hook? Maybe you're offering something new and there's a benefit to the public or maybe there's a trend going on that you can speak to because you have expertise. Another option in media relations is the op-ed. The op-ed is an opinion slash editorial, which is an authored piece by an expert in your company that weighs in on something that is a current issue. It's a great way to develop thought leadership and put out an expert voice from your company. And newspapers are looking for op-eds every single day. So there's lots of opportunities to get published. But media relations is something that you want to use wisely, just like any other marketing channel. And because I was a journalist for so long, I look at media relations with reverence and I build relationships with media folks so that I know what they're looking for and I respect the work that they're doing. And I don't go to them and say, look at me, look at me, I'm the best thing ever. I think this story is timely for this reporter or anchor or editor at this time, and I'm helping them to get information. And so again, that mutual benefit, that relationship aspect factors into media relations. Another thing about media relations is you don't want to um, make yourself a pest. So I've had clients who love being on TV and they just want more and more and more. It's called the PR high. And the thing is you can outstay your welcome. So you wanna make sure that you're pitching media as a tool in marketing when it makes sense for you and for the media outlets only, not all the time. Okay. Another marketing tool is the e-blast. So if you have an email newsletter, if you're staying in front of people through email on a monthly basis or weekly basis, um, it might be storytelling, it might be coupons, whatever it is, but that's a great marketing tool as well. I usually create an editorial calendar for clients. And those are the topics per month that we're going to include for the next year. So the e-blast has an editorial calendar as well. And usually we like to have the themes of each month correlate to media relations, to social media, to everything else. Advertising is another marketing channel. And that's something to think about um, because there's an endless, seemingly endless um, array of options to spend your money and to buy ads. But again, you wanna make sure you're doing it wisely where your audience is and with the message that they need to hear with a very tangible, do something now that is really meaningful to them. Some other channels. Blogging, if you haven't thought about blogging, maybe that's something to consider in 2021. Um, There's two reasons to blog. One is to add content to your website, which improves your SEO or search engine optimization. And another one is to build some thought leadership. And so giving some authoritative voices to you and your company leaders on your website. So um, blogging um, is a great endeavor. I'm a writer, I love it. But again, I usually plan out on an editorial calendar Um, the themes for the blogs, the topics throughout the year so that it makes sense to come from your company. Video, marketing materials, events, these are all ways to get in front of people. Video can be used on social media, on your website, marketing materials you might distribute, put in the mail. Events, I'm hoping that in 2021, we can get back face to face. But if not, do you want to offer a webinar? Do you want to have some Zoom talks, um, ways to meet your company? 
the best way to build your business is to be person to person. So events are a key way to do that. But also that could mean attending events. So maybe you want to go to networking events or you want to have different opportunities to be in the community. And that is something that should go on your marketing plan as well. Finally, in the bottom row here of different marketing tasks, your website is something that you want to continually be reviewing and make sure it makes sense. It probably deserves a refresh every two to three years. And so if your website hasn't been updated in a while, you might wanna look at it. But as I said earlier, it needs to speak to the person who has a need. And when they come to your site, they feel reassured and that they're in good hands. It's not necessarily just about you. It's really tricky. So how to you know, create a functionality and how to write the content has to be with an eye towards your audience. We've talked a lot about relationship building, that human to human relationship is what moves business forward because people do business with people. And so what relationships are going to be key for you in 2021? Brand ambassador initiatives are when you have satisfied customers who love your brand and they wanna move it forward and you take charge and you create sort of a brand ambassador campaign where you reward certain people and arm them with content or graphics or whatever it is to promote you in a specific way and it becomes a win-win-win. And then of course, coupons and referrals, that goes into sort of all of this as well. These are just some, you guys, these are some of the marketing tasks that we use for clients and things that you wanna get specific about in your marketing plan. So I may have forgotten some for you. And if so, add them to your own list. But when you are mapping out 2021 marketing, you want to look at each of these venues and you want to assess how have we been successful so far? How could we be more so in the year to come? How am I using each of these channels? to move my company forward toward accomplishing our goals. That's super important. Lori, did you have something you wanted to add? Yes, I do have a question for you. If you have yeah. a smaller budget, uh, where do you get started? Where do you recommend? I know you said it was an evergreen process, but where do you get started? If you have a small budget, what would you recommend in these tasks? Okay, so a small budget for each of these tasks or a small marketing budget in general? Small marketing budget in general as a small business. It's a really good question, Lori. So, you know, most small businesses have almost no budget for marketing and that's understandable, but marketing is what moves you forward. And so um, when you can articulate your goals and you know what you want to accomplish and then work backwards, it usually becomes apparent where you're gonna have the most bang for your buck. So like social media is something you can do easily internally. Lots of companies outsource their social media, but I'm a big believer that they probably shouldn't like maybe hire someone to coach you or consult on how to go forward. Um, maybe spend the money on hiring somebody like me to create a plan for you and then you implement it. I do a lot of coaching and training internal staff members so that they feel comfortable and adept at doing the social media inside the company. And that makes the most sense because you're on the ground every day with your company, you know what's happening. And so it makes more sense for you to post than it does for me. And right. so I'm a big fan of that. Um, I don't, I think media relations would be my um, least important um, place to spend money. It is expensive to hire somebody to pitch you to media. And like I said, it's a, it, you'll see a blip, an increase, and then it'll just go quiet. And so for media relations to make a significant difference, you've got to do it consistently. And I don't know that it's worth it if you have a small budget. Um, something like blogging or e-blasts, those are also easy to handle in-house. And so maybe I guess the answer to your question is to um, hire somebody to take a, a broad look at what you're doing and what you want to accomplish. Like come to that meeting with your goals articulated and then they can make the recommendation. Here's where you should be and maybe come up with a plan for you and then send you on your way. I think that's the best way to invest. Excellent, great answer, yeah. thank you. Yeah, sure. All right, um, so you know, like I said over and over again, you want to have a very specific plan so that you know what you're doing each month and it, it becomes very easy. So when I do this for clients, I'm kind of doing it for myself, like wink, wink, nudge, nudge, because if I have a client for whom I'm doing all the marketing and they have a monthly e-blast and I create an editorial calendar with 12 months of topics for their e-blast, then it makes it super easy for me to say, what's January? And I take a look and then I can go write the articles, gather the materials and get it ready for the client instead of having to bother the client and say, what are we writing about in January? Um, so it's super, super important. I think planning an editorial calendar is the best thing you can do for your marketing because then you know 
what holidays are we going to honor or mention or have a special for? What um, are there anniversaries for the company? Are there certain launch times? Like for example, when my book comes out in February, I'm gonna have a whole book launch that's gonna happen. And so I wanna plan that out so that I know it's coming and I, and I can you know hit it well instead of muck it up in some way. Um, so when you have that editorial calendar, you know the subject matter um, that you're going to focus on. But then you can also set dates and deadlines. So you can say like monthly e-blast is gonna go out on the 15th of each month, which means I need to have my content a week before by the eighth. And then there's a review process in there to make sure everybody's happy with it. So we can achieve that goal, which means I might need to start on it on the first to gather the material so that, you know, it's all ready to go for the review process. So dates and deadlines, I'm a big fan. Again, sometimes we sort of pass them and that's okay. Um, but the other thing to do is to assign activities to different people so that you know what you own. So if I'm in charge of the blog, then, you know, okay, I can work on that. And somebody else is handling social media and still somebody else is doing the advertising strategy. I think um, then it's a team effort. And if you are a small team, that's the best way to go about it. So maybe you have somebody who's in charge of marketing or communications and they may do all of this and that's really great. Um, they should probably involve different people on the team so that you have the authentic voices from your company represented in all of your marketing. Um, but if you don't have somebody, if you're small and you don't have a marketing person internally or externally, then it has to be a team effort. Because again, as I've said several times, you guys don't move forward without marketing. Marketing is the aspect of taking your company to market. And you can think, you can offer the greatest programs and services in the world. But if nobody knows you or trusts you, it's not gonna do any good. So it's essential to get out there. How you do it is really up to you. But again, if you have a plan, if you share the responsibilities, then you're more likely to succeed with it. And it isn't a burden for any one person. So that's super important. Again, you can tell I'm a big type A planner and that's just really important um, to adopt that attitude because then it makes it easy for you. Then you're not always like knee jerk last minute. I'll give you guys a great example. Um, I've worked with clients who want, they, they do end of year appeals and so like nonprofits. And you know that this comes every single year. You know that people finish giving their donation dollars Usually at this time of year, they're, they're scrambling to do it. Um, there's also Giving Tuesday, which is usually the end of November, beginning of December. And that's a huge campaign on social media. Um, likewise, we have Black Friday, Small Business Saturday, Cyber Monday, all those things happen around the same time. We know that these come every year. So right now, I would be planning for next year because I don't want to be in the 11th hour working on an appeal or just trying to decide, you know, why should I have somebody give and what's, what's the incentive? Like, this is stuff you can plan for. There are very few instances in business when you have to be last minute. So why choose to be if you can avoid it? Because you'll be so much more successful and articulate. You won't have typos, you won't have mistakes if you can take the time to plan ahead. So if you know that's coming, you know, give yourself the gift of planning. All right, so I've mentioned this a few times throughout the presentation and I, I can't reiterate it enough, but the power of relationships to move a business ahead is infinite. So I really believe people do business with people. You could be a humongous company with multi-million dollar revenues and global reach, but at the end of the day, the transactions happen from one person to another. And so it's really important when you're looking at your marketing to ask who the essential people are to move your brand forward. Do you have speakers, voices that you want to put front and center, who's the face of your company or faces, it could be more than one person. Um, the people are what other people are going to connect with. And so it's really important to think about that. Like, who does your customer want to see and who's going to be the most compassionate and compelling so that they feel cared for and they feel heard and seen and that they matter to your brand. So really identify who are those faces and voices in your company that are going to move the brand forward. That when somebody sees Joe Smith, they know he represents ABC company and they feel very comfortable. Like I know Joe, okay? So that's really, really important. Um, how do they connect with your audience? So is it through social media? Like social media posts that have people in visual and voice 
are so much more successful than product pictures or um, just static content posts. When you see a person and that person represents the brand, those posts do a lot better. So think about how the people who are gonna move your brand forward are going to be presented to the public through what channels, how frequently, in what way, video, photos, I mean, how? Let's think about that. We talked about mutual benefit and I think it's a great exercise to take a look at what the benefit is for the people who come to you, not just because they, they purchase a service or a product, but how does it improve their lives? Because let's be honest, we are at a time when a lot of people don't need much, um, but they make purchases or transactions because it, it helps their life, the quality of life. And so how are you going to transcend the transactions in such a way that there's more meaning to it and you're benefiting someone's life? Think about that. And then finally, if you're deliberate in your ask, like you tell people, here's what I want from you, you're more likely to get it. So this is true in blogs, e-blasts, ads, um, pretty much everything. Like think about um, when you send out an e-blast, you should have what is called a call to action in every article that you have in that e-blast. So there's a click here, there's a do this now, there's a read this article, uh, learn more, whatever it is, schedule a consultation. You should have them on your website. You should have it in social media posts. When you ask somebody, hey, will you do this? They might say yes. And if you don't make the ask, they don't know what you want from them. So be very, very clear and just say, this is what I'm looking for. Are you in? And then finally, don't wait for referrals or assume that they're going to happen. You can make them happen. So that's like when I mentioned the brand ambassador initiatives. Um, when you deliberately talk with your biggest fans and you empower them to represent your brand and maybe you reward them with you know, a gift card to the local coffee shop or, you know, free month of your service or whatever it is, there's a benefit for them. And then their enthusiasm is infectious and it will bring other people your way. But if you don't ask them for those referrals, you may not get them because we tend to refer people when we think of something, but sometimes I don't know about you, you know, things fall out of my head. I don't remember everything all the time. So I may have been really satisfied with the service of a particular company, and it may have left my memory. And so how can I refer them? But if they ask me to, I will, I'm more likely to do it. I'll give you a great example. I um, frequent an acupuncture practice near me and it's phenomenal. I love it. And I've, go, I've been going there for years, but um, they sent out an e-blast and they said, if you give a review for our business on Google or Yelp, um, we will give you $10 off your next session. Well, hello, why wouldn't I do that, right? And so, I right away wrote some online reviews for them because I do really love what they do. And I got $10 off the next session. I mean, that's like free money. So if you can do something like that and it benefits you and it benefits your customer, why not do it, okay? All right, we only have a little time left. So if you have a question, please um, put it in the Q&A so that I can make sure I give you some attention. All right, so my big final like, you know, esoteric thought is a back to purpose and why. So I can't say this enough. So maybe you've learned by now that I'm sort of obsessed with meaning and purpose. It's really what I do and what I love to do the most. And I do think that work is elevated and more successful and more impactful when we have a purpose behind it. So we're in a time when a lot of people are defined by the work they do. Um, companies may not really look at the human values behind what they have to offer, just what they sell. But what if you looked at your company for 2021 and said, how do we make a difference in the world? How do we make our community better? How do we improve people's lives? If that was driving your story, would that change your success? Would that uh, compel people to want to patronize your business more? I'm guessing yes. But it's a worthwhile exercise. It's just, you know, do a free write or a conversation in the office and see what comes out because the work you do is way more than tasks and activities. It's so important to understand why you exist and why you uniquely impact the marketplace. So there may be lots of businesses that offer similar services or products, but what do you do and you alone? And how is your signature style really benefiting people and making the world better? So when you go to articulate your foundational narrative, 
take a look at these questions with the butterflies in front of them on the screen. Why do you do what you do? So maybe you're the business owner or maybe you're an employee and why are you there? You know, if you're an employee, why did you take this job? Why do you stay in it? If you own the business, why did you create it? And why do you keep it going? Um, look at the, in the, the founding story for your organization. That is a really key element of your foundational narrative. And it's something that you want to go back to again and again. There's usually a reason somebody starts a small business. There's a dream, there's a passion, and you wanna make sure that that's part of your story because other people have the same dreams and passions. When you tie into that, you start to create a connection. The most successful organizations create connection and impact. They make people's lives better. They, they create happiness, um, satisfaction, um, and community. You know, there's a sense of belonging. And it's really, really important that you look at higher purpose for your work in your business story for 2021. If, if you do one thing, identify what that is and start to really frame everything around it. When you focus on the why, you elevate your work, you elevate the outcomes, and there's a reason that people want to engage with you. It's just so easy when you can do that. I know it's a little bit esoteric to think about, but it's not beyond reach. And I think it's probably the most powerful thing you can do to benefit your business in the year to come. All right, so if you would like to connect, um, I would love to hear from you. I, I have a new book coming out. I'm happy to tell you guys about that when it does. There's gonna be lots of tips for marketing with meaning, um, but please send your email in the chat um, or you know, just send me an email if you'd like to. And uh, if there's any questions, now would be the time. I'd love to hear from you guys. Thank you, Lynn. We've had a very quiet audience today, <laughs> uh, but I, your presentation was great, great content and very thorough. I can tell you are very passionate about what you do and I appreciate that. Um, it really shines through. And Thank you. I also can tell that you are a teacher at heart and I can see you working <laughs> with college students. Uh, nice job. Thank you for sharing this with us. Oh, there might be a couple of questions that popped up. Looks oh, like good. a couple of people saying thank you. Uh, they're listening intently. Uh, thank you for I'm sharing so your um, All right, one question. Yeah. How long do you recommend I spend making the foundational narrative? Would that be a day, a week? How long would that process usually take then? Well, you're talking to a writer at heart. And so I like <laughs> spending a lot of time on writing, but that could be daunting. So um, it depends how you want to do it. So you could start by just, you know, devoting a day. And that's a great idea because if you can take time away from your typical business schedule and just get clear, uh, maybe take a walk in the cold or something, and then um, jot down whatever comes to mind, at least you're going to have some clarity. If you can make it a team effort, um, or you can do some of those interviews that I mentioned, you know, maybe you don't want to do a dozen, maybe you want to talk to three people like a past customer, a current customer, and like a colleague in the company, and just interview them about the company so that you're getting some different perspectives. I think it will help to mm. round out your foundational narrative. And so maybe if you did that, you know, you did your day of writing, and then you talk to some people, you put it all together, I think you'll have a really great start. So yeah, give yourself a day. I think that's really a great idea. Excellent. Uh, next question. When you speak about social media, what is the best social media platform we should use? <laughs> oh boy, there's like no answer to that question because it depends <laughs> what you are doing. So like, um, let me think how I answer that. So, okay, I'll give you an example. I'm starting with a client in January um, that I've known actually most of my life and she is a performer. She's a songwriter, musician, um, author, and her audience is mostly um, young children, so parents of young children. And so for her, I feel like Instagram is the best one because it's very visual and the, the moms and dads of young children are mostly on Instagram. And so I feel like that's where her audience is and she can do little music clips and she can do um, like really fun visual things. So for her, that's the best one. I have another client who's an attorney who's been a client for eight years and she's had a Facebook page, uh, a professional page for a long time. And we, we post to that. She also has her personal LinkedIn. So we decided to do her personal as opposed to a firm page because it's a very small firm. Um, and she wanted to be on Instagram. And I had a very hard conversation with her and said, why? Why do you want to be on Instagram? How do you think it's going to build your business? And we ultimately decided that 
you know, it's really not a benefit for her. So we're, we're not doing Instagram. So we're continuing to post on her professional Facebook page and her personal LinkedIn um, profile. And that's really it. So it just depends where your customers are and what is most conducive for your business. So I know that's not the answer you wanted, but um, that's probably the best answer. Thank you. Nope, that is fair. All right, this one. When choosing a company to help rework a website, what do we expect regarding content writing? Do I provide bullet points? Do I write the content myself? Or is that provided? You know, it depends who you who you contract. And so obviously when somebody hires my company to do a website, I have two web developers who work for me and I work on the content. And so I, because I'm the writer. And so I like to look at that business story and I will create the site map, which is sort of the order for the pages and how we're going to have everything function and flow. And then I'll develop the content with the client. And then my web developer will build out the site. And so um, I think it's really important when you're looking for a company to help you with your website to interview at least three and ask those questions. Do they have a, a writer on staff who understands the needs of website content so that it makes sense and it flows and it, it really connects with the narrative from your, your company. And if they don't, then I would look for another company because there's plenty of companies out there who will do this for you and they should have somebody who can, who can do a great narrative on your website that makes sense with your company. All right, excellent. And then this looks like it's our final question. Uh, last call for questions, get them in folks if you have a question for Lynn. This one comes from Thomas. How do you feel about interns as a way to execute the day-to-day -day of your marketing plan? Where do interns best fit? In social, perhaps? It's a great question. Um, so it depends in, on a couple of things. I have a phenomenal intern right now um, from St. Olaf College, where my son is a student, actually one of my sons. And so um, she's working on some research for me, and she uh, may work on some social media at some point. Um, I have another student um, intern for another client who's doing social media, that can help. The problem can be if you have an intern for a finite period of time, like fall intern, summer intern, whatever it is, um, they're there, they do the work, and then they're gone, and then you have to start over. And there's always a learning curve when it comes to your company story, style, tone, all of that stuff. And so you want to make sure that you um, have some co continuity because otherwise you're going to be doing it. So you're gonna to have to start and stop with lots of people. The other thing is if the intern is paid or not. So if it's an unpaid intern who's getting college credit, let's say, um, you want to make sure that it's very specific work that fits in with what they're learning in school. And they're, it's like a class for them. So they're really coming to learn from you. Whereas if it's a paid intern, they're looking at it as a job and they may take it more seriously. So I think, um, I've had the most success in having interns do things like data entry, research, um, attend meetings, learn from different people on the team because they're really looking for a learning opportunity. And then I've hired some interns because they did such a great job. Once they're part-time staff members, then there's some continuity and they get into a groove and that's usually more successful for social. Thank you, Lynn, that's a great answer. I know at our organization, uh, we have done the same. We have done uh, internship with students for credit and then also internship with students um, as an employer. Uh, it's a great learning opportunity for both the um, organization as well as the student. And uh, one of the things we love is the technology ability of the students that they can bring to the table and offer that we may not always have. So very exactly, exciting. exactly. Yeah. Well, that looks like that is the end of our questions today. Lynn, I can't thank you enough. Really good content. Uh, we'll share these slides and the video on our website uh, to all. Uh, and thank you. Getting uh, a couple notes from your attendees. Thank you. Great job. Really enjoyed it, Lynn. Uh, thanks so much, everybody. And thank you, Lori, for having me. I really appreciate it. All right. Take care. Bye now. Bye.